you can do so many things with high level and this little piece will kind of like save some pain along the way of learning by mistake. So hopefully, hopefully you can internalize this, remember it and, and just let it be kind of like a little road marker, a little warning sign as you're building your next workflow and you're putting it together as trigger. We're going to get nerdy. Nerdy. We're talking, <laughs> we're talking workflow trigger filters. So we'll start with the anatomy of a workflow. So a workflow is you have a trigger, something that starts the automation, and then you've got actions. What are the automations? Technically, you can add to a workflow without a trigger. Because you okay. could actually have one of your actions like add to workflow. Or you could um, you could do a bulk action through the smart list where you just like add to workflow. So technically, you don't have to have triggers, but the majority of workflows when you build them, if it's like a standalone automation, there's something that adds people into the into the workflow, and that's the trigger, and then you've got these actions. And so today we wanted to talk through trigger filters. This is where I see people stumble because, because the system is so robust. You can do so many things with high level, and this little piece will kind of like save some pain along the way of, you know, just like learning by mistake. So hopefully, hopefully you can internalize this, remember it and, and just let it be kind of like a little road marker, a uh, little warning sign as you're building your next workflow and you're, you're putting it together as trigger. So when you go to add a trigger, there's a whole set of possible actions. I'll pick a common one, which is like order form submitted. Order form submitted is when someone buys on a one step checkout or a two step checkout form on like a funnel. It's interesting because there's actually another trigger called order submitted that's not the same thing. That has to do with like if you're using invoices, they really, some of their naming conventions overlap there. So we're talking order form submitted and it is on a funnel. Hypothetically, you can set up a trigger without any filters. It's just order form submitted. That means anytime any order form on a funnel is submitted, this automation is going to run. That's probably not what you want. Most of the time, that's not what you want. So then you got to filter. So then I can filter. I can say, okay, I want to uh, filter by a couple. Well, I'll just walk, walk through all the possibilities. You could funnel. Uh, you could filter by funnel. Like what funnel is it? Or website? What? What? That's the whole website, the whole funnel. You can filter by that. Still, if they buy on any page of the funnel, this workflow is not going. That's going to run. So you might be like, okay, that's that's not specific enough. Okay, now I'm gonna now I'm gonna filter by step. I think they call it page actually in the filter there, but step if you're in the editor page if you're on the in the in the workflow filter so you could specify to the exact page that uh, purchase could happen still not specific enough because if you have a two step checkout form there's technically you could filter by submission type and so they call it an opt in there's bumps and then there's uh, I think it's purchase or buy and I think there's actually another um, there's an upsell so there's a one click upsell so there's or at least four different submission types that could be there, right? It could be the bump. It could be uh, the opt-in, basically step one of a two-step. Um, it could be the, um, the upsell and then the purchase. So if you're following along, you can see how if you don't use the filters, what ends up happening? You get these workflows firing. You're like, why are they firing when this is happening? Or like one of the most common issues is people didn't, fil they didn't filter for what kind of submission. Yep. And what happens? Every time they start, it acts like they bought and they haven't paid you a dime. So people are like, why do they have access to my course? Why did they get access to all this stuff? And they never actually purchased. Well, it's because you had a two-step checkout form, which I love. I love two-step checkout forms, but that means you got to differentiate between an opt-in, meaning they started the checkout process and an actual sale, meaning they they actually they completed. They put in their credit cards and, and you received money for it. And so you can actually filter even further to product because let's say you've got multiple options in there and you're saying like, okay, if they buy this product, I want to run this automation flow. If they buy this product, I want to run this autom automation flow. So you can get as specific or as general as makes sense. So I'll give you an example of a general workflow where let's say we've got a, a custom field for lifetime value. I might run a workflow that says anytime a purchase happens and I'm going to filter for purchase. And I, I might have three triggers here because I might have one for purchases. I might have one for uh, bumps and I might have one for upsells. All three of those are when an actual transaction occurs a, as an example. And, and now what I might do is for every single one of my funnels, when a transaction occurs, I run uh, an action and it basically I would do the, the math action and I would say, add whatever the purchase amount was to the lifetime value of this contact. Like, well, that's great. I could set up one automation and it's going to run. So every time any purchase happens, it's adding to the lifetime value 
of this contact. And that would be an appropriate wide, you know, wide trigger and, uh, and workflow. It'd be a very simple workflow, but you, like that comes in handy. You don't, you don't have to rebuild that every t- single time. You set up that one global automation. It's tracking your lifetime value. On the other side of it, um, and this is where people, you know, have issues, is if you have like a grant access to a, a digital product or you're emailing them a link, like, like they're immediately getting access, that's where you want to be specific. And you might specify yeah. all the way down to this product. Because let's say, you know, for whatever reason, uh, um, you've got two different, let's say you've got a, a pay in full and a payment plan option. That's like a common, you know, you've got two different purchase options, pay in full and payment plan. And you kind of say, hey, if you do pay in full, not only are you saving some money, but you also get some other bonuses, right? You you might get some additional assets or whatever it is. That's a scenario where you want to specify all the way down to the product level. So you're going to have like four, um, we'd have funnel, page, submission type, and then product. So you're going to have four filters applied to this trigger to make sure and when you're granting these bonus assets, um, it's only going to the folks that actually selected the correct product, not just everybody who buys on the page. So there's um, there's a little discussion about workflow trigger filters. Uh, and I think uh, I, I, I it's think. really good, and I like that you broke down and separated like the different some of the different things. Maybe before we sign off on this one, what are yeah. some of the common errors that people make when they're building out some of these? Because these are really important, and I think sometimes people think that workflow triggers are going to be simple and yeah. they can be once you've really understood the, the structure. Yeah. Uh, so what are some of the common stumbling blocks? Categorically, not testing it. We got people on the team. I surround myself with people who think this way and I don't think this way, but it's the concept is trust, but, but verify. I just trust and walk away. So trust, but verify <laughs> means like you did it. I trust it's good, but then you verify. So how do I know it works? It's because I tested it myself. So that like, categorically, if you just make sure you always test it before you send it into the wild, you're going to at least catch the error before it's consequential. Cause you'll be like, I tried it myself. And, and you might be like, man, that's so annoying. So I got to like run the, the checkout process flow one. I'd be like, yes, at, at worst case scenario. Also there's test mode. So mm-hmm. like there's a checkout test mode and you can run that and it would it work the same way. Or you can, you can set up yourself like a global coupon. Basically it is like a hundred, hundred percent off coupon. That's some of the ways that we'll, uh, we'll run our testing is just make sure, Hey, we've got a hundred percent off coupon. And it's a setting inside of the, um, the order form, whether coupons are on or off. Most of the time for us, it's off. So in our testing, we'll turn it on, run the, run the test through. But so test everything before you send it to the wild is going to save you a lot. Um, and then as like a more specific error point that I see, it's, it's the filters. Like that's why we're talking about the filters because yeah. this is the stumbling block. People not having specific or having too specific. It's usually yeah. on on one end, like either end of the spectrum. Um, and then I guess close to that, it's just actually having the wrong trigger for what they wanted. And I can't, I can't fault you because some of the naming convention is confusing. I, I'm telling you, like it, it, there isn't, there is not a hundred percent consistency. And here's why, if I were to, you know, defend high level for a second. In English, we have a lot of terms that we understand. It's like, you call it something different in one context than than the other context. So uh, an example, I'm trying to think of like an everyday terminology for this, where it's like, oh, before, you know, in, in one area, we call it this word, in another area, we call it this word, and, and all of us just like take it for granted. And um, I might be blanking on that example, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, maybe if you're listening, you'll have one in mind. So high level, when you're uh, filling out a field, they call it a field, right? Because it is yeah. the thing that you fill it out. After you've filled out that field, it's now called a value. So a, a filled out version of a field is a value. And so this is where you might be like, oh, I'm editing a custom field or a contact field. And then I'm inputting a contact value or a custom value. So that like, you're like, ah, that, that makes sense. Like you should have a different name for the empty version and the full version, right? Yeah. So, and there are other things that happen where we're familiar with it and we're used to that, right? If I say, I'm a, you know, pass me, pass me a glass, you assume it's empty or unless the context says it's going to be full, right? Or versus like, hey, can you pass me my water? 
you're like, oh, I assume it's full. Like, and right. so that's maybe not the best example there, but the, there are some things like that where it's like the empty and full version of the same thing have different names. And uh, that that can create some confusion there because you, you accidentally chose the wrong trigger for what you wanted, but just testing it will, will allow you to kind of figure out that you made that mistake. And I think that is the a little bit of a reminder that you got to think like the engineers. These were this was a machine built by engineers that are very smart, and don't always think like the marketer. Uh, you got to be able to put both hats on to get something working. This is really good stuff um, with trigger filters, and hopefully helpful for everyone uh, to go build some more powerful workflows.